Hello and welcome once again to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, the unique insight into life behind the scenes at the Cherries, where we aim to bring parts of the club to life for you by talking to some of the key figures. Once again, alongside myself, Chris Temple, is club journalist, the man behind a lot of the terrific written pieces on the club's media channels, Neil Perrett. Neil, good day to you. Good day to you, Chris. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, today now we're going to be talking perfectly honed athletes, optimum nutrition, things that you and I haven't exactly followed throughout our careers. That's a bit unfair, Chris. I I run to the pub most nights and uh, (laughs) and, and sprint back from the chippy as well. (laughs) Well, we should add before we start that with current COVID safety guidelines in mind, we're recording this episode virtually, all sat behind our laptops in different locations. Well, in this series so far, we've spoken to technical director Richard Hughes, Dutch winger Arnout Danjuma and January signing Jack Wilshire. If you haven't yet heard those, then do pop back through our catalogue and enjoy. Well, today in episode four, we spin the wheel again and take you into the science behind AFC Bournemouth with one of our longest serving members of first team staff. Now, our guest started his career in football at Manchester City before joining Rochdale. He then swapped Spotland for the South Coast, joining the Cherries in 2012 under Paul Groves. It's a very warm welcome to the podcast, to the club's head of sports science, Dan Hodges. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Neil. Looking forward to um, it. Now, Dan, let's, uh, it's great to have you. Let's, uh, first of all, flesh out some of those career bullet points uh, for us. Talk us through your journey in football to where we sit here today. Yeah, so I started my, um, my undergraduate journey at Bruno University in, in London. Um, as I got through the end of my first year, I realised I was no longer going to be a professional footballer, unfortunately. So I thought, right, how can I get myself in there and, and, and actually work within elite football? Um, so no, on a serious note, I had, I had a big interest in the performance side of, of, of football, obviously, and, and wanted to be a part of it. Um, so I, I completed my undergraduate and towards the back end of my, my third year, um, I managed to, to get in touch with the head of sports science at Manchester City at the time, so Damien Roden. Um, we actually had a, a meeting whilst I was in the midst of sitting my, my final exams. I think Man City were playing Spurs away. Um, so I, I went across London to a hotel and, and met him for breakfast. Um, and obviously being a bit starstruck at the time, there was lots of Man City players around the place and I was a bit in awe of it. Um, but hopefully, well, must have come across well and managed to secure uh, an internship. It was initially to help them out with the following pre-season um, for the six weeks. And then luckily I, I managed to keep my head down and, and earn like a two year contract, a fixed term contract as, as their intern. Um, that was kind of alongside <coughs> working with the with the twenty ones, uh, the EDS Elite Development Squad at the time, and and helping out with the first team as well. So it, it was very good. It was, you know, it was a very good grounding for me. Some say, uh, you know, a, a very luxurious grounding to go from from nothing to Manchester City. But I, I learned from um, some amazing people there, and and obviously from there went to Rochdale, um, which was probably at the other end of the spectrum, um, but equally <laughs> equally as important. And then obviously you make the move to the Cherries in 2012. And of course, you've been at a Premier League club. But talk us through the, the club, I guess, as it was made up when you joined in 2012. Because presumably back then, what, eight, nine years ago, sports science was, was still pretty evolutionary at a Bournemouth level. Yeah, definitely. I, I came from Rochdale, like I said, and, and that, you know, that there had been a fitness coach before me um, who was very good and everyone spoke really highly of. Um, so then I, I came down here and... And there was already a, a really good gym in place. There was the infrastructure. The pitches were were not quite there yet, where we train now um, on the pavilion side of it. But they were just growing through. So we did a pre-season at Camford um, and then ended up coming to the training pitches here as, as the season got underway. Um, it, it was it was really good, really exciting. I was a little bit nervous at the time, obviously coming down from, from Manchester. Um, but it was nothing too new as I obviously went from London to Manchester in the first place. Um, I, I had an interview with Paul and, and uh, I, I managed to get the job title of head of sports science, even though I was head of no one apart from myself. <laughs> um, so <laughs> thought ahead on that side, luckily, um, and, and obviously kept that kept that title all the way through. Um, so Paul employed me with Sean Brooks. Garv came in at the same time as me. Garv and Stuart, who's still here now, our, our head analyst. Um, and it, it was yeah, it was really good. The, the, you could see the club was. No disrespect to Rochdale, but the club here was was geared up to to go further. They were spending a little bit more money on the infrastructure. The playing squad was was better, and they wanted to to get up through the leagues, which was you know really important from my side of things as well. And I was excited to start. 
You just give me an idea, actually, to uh, get myself head of commentary as my new title, <laughs> even though I'm the only one. Um, how would you how would you sum up your your eight or so years? Because I think it's fair to say you've the roller coaster has probably turned a full a full circle, if you like, in those eight years. Yeah, it, it was an absolute whirlwind to start off with. Um, didn't we didn't start the season too well, which ultimately led to to the, the you know the the leaving of, of, of Sean and Paul, um, and I was very very nervous when I heard that, that Eddie Howe was coming back. I knew that he had taken um, a previous fitness coach with him to Burnley, so I, I was, you know, I was fully expecting to be to be let go, and I was thinking, you know, where do I go from here, really? Um, but luckily enough, I, I I got a chance, and you know, I'd like to say I, I took it at that time, and, th- and that season was was a whirlwind. To, you know, we we were in the bottom half, or I think we we're in the bottom three actually when when Eddie Howe came in, Eddie Howe and JT, and and then we we things changed all of a sudden, and, and everyone started looking up. Obviously promoted that season, um, and then in the championship, it was it was great. I, I was, you know, I'd set my goal early on to kind of get to the championship as as a lead fitness coach, as a head of sports science, and I was really excited to to get there and and test my wit up against some of the guys that I, I knew were in that league from my side of things. Um, and then the club went from strength to strength. We were fully fully supported by everyone at the board, and that's from from the manager to the assistant manager to the chief executive. Everyone was was kind of you know if we if we could justify why we needed you know a certain bits of equipment or what we were doing a certain test for etc then it was it was fully funded and, and and backed in that respect and and we were very lucky so things progressed very quickly in, in terms of our facilities infrastructure from the sports science and medical side. We'll come on a bit later to the differences as you've gone up the divisions in terms of the, your day to day, I guess. But let's let's go right back to the start. Let's strip this back because a lot of people won't actually know exactly what to makes up your department. It started with just you, but tell us now what your department is personnel wise, uh, who's there, and what their roles are. Yeah, it started with me and, and grew infinitely. Um, to be honest with you, I, I took on a, an intern, Ben Donerkey, um, who worked worked with me, and he was working. He was working here till two o'clock and then he'd go and, and work at the bank because we weren't paying him as an intern here and then he'd come back the next day and work till two. It's a little bit frustrating actually because I ended up cleaning up all the bottles and everything myself, which I, I didn't want to be doing at that time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but he at the end of that season when we got promoted to the championship, he was taken on full time and, and fully earned that. Um, ben was pretty much on the whole journey with me um, and I, I can't speak highly enough of Ben. We, he, was, he then turned into our strength coach and looked after you know, the gym side of things. Obviously, I was overseeing everything, but he was leading that. Um, ben was there. We had various interns as well. Um, then Phil Keane, he, he started as an intern. He's now working with the first team. So we hired him. He worked with Perch when, when Perch was with the 21s. Um, he was his lead fitness coach. Phil, Phil, everyone knows Phil. He's a very popular guy around here. He, he worked extremely hard. Um, he's been with the 21s for, he was with the 21s for about five years, turned into a full-time role. And now he's been promoted and up with the first team and, and fully deserved and, and really, you know, earning his, his stripes up with the first team and, and respected the players and, and managers. So Ben, it was Ben, it was, it was Phil. I've got um, Rob Lloyd, who, who again interned with us as a placement student. Um, he was from Loughborough University. He, he interned with us and then, uh, and then had to go back and do his placement finished his degree off. Um, he went to Leicester for a year whilst that happened. And then in the meantime, I managed to get a little bit more budget and, and, and brought him back. So he's now like our, our, our first, one of our first team sports scientists. Um, so he looks after a lot of the, a lot of the data in, in the gym. So a lot of our testing, our jump testing, he, he does on-field rehab. Um, and he's a real key member of our team. Um, one I've probably missed out is, is Sean McCullough. Sean is our data how would I describe it? His job title is first team sports scientist again, but he deals with all our data, all our databasing, all of our crunching of numbers. And, and I couldn't, I definitely couldn't be without Sean. I actually met him at the end of our first year in the Premier League. I think he came over as part of our GPS company and he was our contact there. And he showed me some some bits and pieces that, that, that he was doing on the side. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I need, I want you in this department. You're going to make this department better. So I, I spoke with the then manager at the time, Eddie Howe. Um, he fully supported it, and we managed to get him on board as well. Um, yeah, so, so that's my team at the minute. There's been some staff that have come and gone in the meantime, but ultimately it's myself, Phil Keane, uh, Rob Lloyd, and, and Sean McCullough at the moment. 
Dan, you spoke earlier about the differences between Bournemouth and Rochdale, but what about the differences between going from Manchester City to Rochdale? What what was that like for you? Yeah, at Manchester City, you, you want for nothing. They had it was. I actually started in the just at the end of their their buyout. You know, when the, when the shake took over, so things went you know exponential from there, and exponential growth in terms of staff and facilities, etc. So really lucky to work there. And then when I went to Rochdale with um, Steve Ayer, who, was, who gave me my first opportunity to, to kind of lead a department and, and be a first team fitness coach, it was, it was certainly an eye opener. We didn't initially have a, um, a training ground, so it was scratching around every day to figure out where we we're going to train. Um, we had no, no real equipment in terms of, you know, poles, balls, etc. cetera. Um, and, and monitoring, the monitoring side of things was difficult in terms of heart rate, GPS, um, they did have a heart rate monitoring system, which I use, but GPS, no. But it, but it was a real, it was a club where, very similar to here, but on a smaller scale, where everyone wanted you to do well. Everyone was living and breathing the club. Um, and, and I kind of just got my head down and, and really worked hard and supported them as, as best I could. And I, that gave me such good grounding in terms of having to, you know, be transitional on the job. Or I think one of the times we, we <laughs> so it might be seen as a, um, as a negative really, but, I worked there for one season and Steve Ayer, who employed me, unfortunately lost his job in the December of that year. Then took Chris Beach, who was the youth team manager, who, who took over. Um, he got the job for, I think, two months and the results didn't really improve. And then John Coleman and Jimmy Bell came in from, from Accrington Stanley and they took it through into the end of the season. So it was, it was three different spells, three different managers, um, very different. But again, that gave me a very good grounding in terms of my my personal relationships, how I dealt with them, how I dealt with the players, etc. Um, but yeah, really thinking on your feet. I think one of the times, one of the managers, I can't remember who it was, but they they got caught in traffic or an accident or something, and I ended up taking the whole of the training session. Which at the time I was like, oh, wow, what's going on here? What do I do? But you know, the the lads are on board, and I, I managed to wing my way through that session. But um, you know, those kind of experiences really shape you for for the future. I, I think. Rochdale's renowned for its meat and potato pies as well, Dan. Did you get stuck into them? Neil, that, that is not me, unfortunately. I am aware of the nutritional side of uh, the value of things, so I, I stayed well away. <laughs> Listen, you've been on the journey, like you said, from the depths of League One to the, to the Premier League here. And is it is it like a player's sort of mentality? Are you similarly competitive with your rivals in sports science when you, as you come through the leagues? You, you sort of touched on it earlier. Um, I, I, yeah, there, there's, there is, it's, it's kind of, it's not really spoken about, obviously, but, but people, the, the thing about sports science and especially in football is no one's really doing anything that different to each other, if you know what I mean. So obviously managers have different philosophies and, and different training methods, etc., uh, And that has a big influence on things. But no, in, in terms of recovery, nutrition, invariably people are kind of doing very similar things. Um, my, my, my very best friend, Ali Harris is uh, he's head of performance at Fulham now. Um, and he, he, he started at Fulham as I started at Man City, or I think a year after as an intern and, and kind of worked his way up. So he was one of the best men at my wedding. He's, you know, one of the godfather to my, my two little girls. Um, so we, we banter back and forth. And there's kind of, a, you know, an underlying rivalry, of course, but we want the best for each other. But what I'm saying is we, we're able to speak shop and, and see what, what we're doing. And although there is a, a slight rivalry there, it's, it's always good to kind of um, compete against each other. And that, that actually happened once, actually, when he was head of performance, when they had their first year in the Premier League. So before this one, the last time they were in the Premier League. And there, there was just a, it was a great, great day for me, my family, his family all there. And, and it was a really good day. And, and we won as well, which is brilliant. Dan, I've got to say, when I, when I sort of go back to the early 90s, when I first started covering the club, which was probably long before you were born, but not Chris, perhaps. Um, <laughs> sports science, it was almost unheard of. In those days here, we had someone like Sean O'Driscoll, who was playing physiotherapist, youth team manager, and he was probably driving the team bus as well. And that was all in all in one, Dan. How it's just evolved so quickly, has it not? Yeah, it, it definitely has, Neil. Um, you know, from, from the facilities that we have to the equipment we use and... And yeah, but, but ultimately, I, I think you, we always have to remember sports science sometimes has a, has a bad rap for putting blocks on players and, you know, you can't do this, we can't do that. But, you know, we're, we're there to, to kind of help 
guide the manager in and make him or help him think about things that maybe he didn't think about in the past. So under no circumstance would I be saying, no, 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 don't do this, do this, do this, or, or likewise, take any credit for any success, any, any wins or anything the team have had, any fitness things the team have had. I, I don't think that that's part of it. You're there to kind of guide the process and, and help, help become an expert in, in the side of things that you're responsible for. I think that's important to get across. Talking about responsible, what is your remit and what are your responsibilities, Dan? So, ultimately, responsible for the for the fitness of the team. I, I think um, that obviously delves into a, a different categories in terms of recovery, nutrition. You know, the strength side of things, um, mo monitoring on a, on a daily basis. So it's it's really putting training plans in, in or helping the manager and, and the coaching staff to put training plans in place and, and provide little recommendations based on the physical side of things, uh, on the physical element of players individually and, and collectively as a team. Um, putting those in place and, and helping, like I said earlier, guide guide the manager in terms of, you know, what, what from a phys physical perspective, what should things look like? What should this day look like? What should this training session look like um, from a, from a, yeah, say it again, a physical perspective. Um, so responsible for, yeah, recovery, nutrition, although I, I would not claim to be any sort of expert in nutrition as um, we I lean on other experts and use their guidance. Um, interestingly, at the minute we're, we're using um, Royce Wiggins. So Royce, he retired from playing and, and worked extremely hard. He's now doing his master's in nutrition. He's got his, his, his diploma in nutrition as well. And, and he is, you know, he is well read and, and really into it at the minute, so we're we're closely linked, and he's helping helping the department on that side. Just coming in, and there about another ex player who, perhaps people don't know as well as Royce Wiggins, Alex Parsons. Has he got some in, or has he had some in, in, in involvement before? Yeah, I, I met Alex at the at the end of or mid mid season last year. Um, he, he's been doing a you know a course or a qualification, a, an Exos qualification, which is a you know a, a strength and conditioning company in the in the USA. Um, and he, he's come in with that. He's worked with a couple of players individually. Um, we had some good feedback just in terms of helping their movement and, and how they, you know, how they execute certain actions on the on the pitch. Um, so yeah, he came in and, and did some sessions with the team and and picked out certain individuals as well, which you know it helped us. I, I think he really had a, a big benefit at the end of last season. Um, unfortunately, COVID, <laughs> COVID stroke, strike. So he hasn't been in since. But I know that he sees a couple of our boys on on Zoom on Zoom meetings, which is good. You spoke about training there, Dan. Just run us through a typical day's training for you personally. Yeah, so so my day would start um, at quarter past six in the gym for my own benefit. <laughs> that is my one main hobby. <laughs> uh, me, me and Phil Keane can often be found in there sweating our nuts off uh, at that time. Um, after that, we, we have a medical and sports science meeting at uh, typically 8 a.m. most days and, that, and that's to plan the day how it looks like from from my side of things how it looks like from the medical perspective um, what injured players are doing etc um, so that that's an important meeting where everyone's on the same page at that point myself and, and Craig Roberts the doc will go and see the manager um, around about half past eight and again the doc will feed back on on availability for training who's who's fit who's not who's training um, and then I'll stay in a little bit longer and, and kind of go through the the training plan for that day depending on what we're doing what physical outcomes we need from that day um, and I'll help you know give my recommendation on that side of things um, and, and then it's just about planning planning the day really what what the warm-up's going to look like what the any conditioning anything we're doing on the pitch is going to look like um, I'll meet with my team and we'll go through that in the morning then at around about 10 30 uh, the guys will do pre-activation, which is almost like a little training preparation, if you like, uh, you know, um, different exercises, which will help the guys prepare for what they're going to face on the field. And, th and then they'll come outside about 10.45. Um, I'll lead the, the first part of the session, the warm up and, and make sure that we, we get the players where they need to be. They will then train um, after training, depending on again, depending on the day, they might go in the gym. Um, we'll oversee that and, and facilitate their session in there. And then it's all about looking at the data from training. And as I mentioned, Sean, he will go through that. Um, I will then look at it, feed back to the manager and go and meet the, the manager and, and, and perch again in, in, the, in the afternoon and kind of go through what, what we did in that day and, and how it looked for the players. 
Um, you touched on it down a minute ago, data. We'll, we'll come on to a match day and your routine for a match day shortly. But that data you're collecting and that Sean is leading on on analysing, I guess. Tell us how you're picking that data up. What what instruments do you use? We always see the players wearing those little heart rate monitor vests and things. How, how are you collecting that data? Yeah, so that, that's a daily thing, Chris. And, and again, like I said earlier, there will be no secrets. Every, every football team in the land, every professional football team in the land will now be using those. Um, but they're GPS monitors. So we can track everything the players are doing on the pitch, you know, from an external perspective in terms of distance covered, high speed running, um, sprints, and then individualize it for themselves, look at their own different thresholds for certain things, for different speeds, etc. cetera. Um, so, so that data, as you can imagine, with 20 players on a daily basis for, for an hour and a half training session, there's, there's lots of it, you know, we've accumulated. Um, I think the only season I didn't have it here was at the start of League One, we, we got it towards the end of League One. So we've got all of that data there. Um, they also wear heart rate monitors, which kind of gives us a little bit of feedback in internally. So how the players are responding centrally to, to that training session or, or to that training stimulus that we're, we're giving them. Um, again, that data is all collated in databases. So we know our our norms for, for certain days, what we expect from certain players in certain positions. Um, we have all that catalogued and, and, and then can feed all that back uh, and the same for, for any drills that we do on the training pitch we, we split all the drills we look at how fullbacks respond how centre mids respond you know is that drill replicating the intensity that we're going to get in a game at the weekend um, and, it, and it's kind of building up all these different libraries so when we are discussing our training sessions we, we know where we're at and roughly what, what kind of response a, an individual player is going to get Just as a brief aside have you ever stuck a heart rate monitor on a manager during a, during a game? No, no, I haven't. That's an interesting topic. No, I haven't. No, I can imagine that'd be quite high, almost scary in some instances. I think I can imagine some managers might go off the charts with that one. Um, now then, give us a, we've given us an idea, a brilliant insight into your training day. Let's imagine it's a home game, as uh, you know you might have in the championship. What, what's your match day uh, for a three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday afternoon? Yeah, so so on a match day, the, the, one of the important things is the, the players that are left out of the squad. Um, that it's really important that they're looked after and, and they're getting what they need. So when ultimately they are called upon, they're, they're ready to perform. Um, so anyone that's left out the squad will either work, will work at the training pitch, be it home or away, um, so that they'll always remain here. And that'll be with either myself or Phil, Rob or, or Sean. Um, so we'll put on a, a training conditioning session for those guys in the morning, um, say about 10 o'clock, for example. They will train and then, and then it's about prepping nutritionally for the game really in, when it comes to a game day the, the work is almost done for the for the training week if you know what I mean so we're setting up for the game we're making sure that players are hydrated they've got what they need in terms of their drinks individualized they've got you know gels etc caffeine everything's set up and ready for them so when they when they report to a game at around about half past one for a three o'clock kickoff um then, then everything's there for them um during the game that there's prep we have a lot of players that will do individual activation so they will on a home game they, they will go across to our gym in, in the stand um, and one of my guys will facilitate their their every need that they need in there so it might be certain isometric exercises or, or different bits of preparation they need to, to perform on the match day as part of their warm-up um, they'll come back over and then about and uh, about two let me think I only think my time is right I can't believe I've forgotten. We've had so many games this year. It's blurred into one. Um, so roughly about 25 past two. So 35 minutes before kickoff, the, the starters will go outside and that's when you'll see me taking the warm-up um, as part of that prep for the game. So they'll do some band work, some, some activation work on the pitch as a team um, and then go through their movement prep, etc. And you, you'll see everything that we do from that perspective with the, with the coaches. Um, during the game, it's, it's just... It's just looking at players. So one of the one of the big things in the championship this year, which I I probably we probably missed the boat on last year in the Premier League, was having the GPS systems in game. Um, so in the Premier League, we never had that because we used to use a camera based system um, and get data league wide. So every team we play, every player in the league, every game in the league, we had that data physically how players were performing. Um, in the championship, we're not as you know it's not as uh, readily available, should I say, cost wise and, and things like that. So we now use GPS in games. It took um, a game or two for players to stop moaning, <laughs> but, but they finally come around to it. Um, so yeah, I'll have a live feed there on an iPad next to the bench. Now, I'm not saying that that helps me make any sort of de any sort of decisions or any form any information to the manager, but it's good to to oversee and look at averages, knowing what 
what players should normally be doing in games, how the team's doing at certain periods of the game. Um, so I'll, I'll be watching that and, and also looking out subjectively, looking out of my eye, how players are, um, providing gels, etc. If, if they need them. Um, yeah, and then post game is the is the worst part of my job is the is the running for the subs, <laughs> which they hate as well. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say myself and Neil will have stood at pitch side on a midweek away game somewhere where it's lashing down with rain at 10 o'clock at night and the subs are coming out to do their running it look, it does look one of the worst jobs of being a footballer yeah I, I yeah <laughs> I'm not gonna lie I've had many a fight with players after games <laughs> <laughs> Just before I let Neil come in there, just a quick one there on the, analysing that data on the bench um, on the iPad. Does the manager ask you, does he say is X knackered or is Y struggling or whatever? Yeah, the man- manager will look for, for feedback for sure. Um, just even, even I will watch the game in a, in, a, in a different perspective to them. Perhaps I'm looking more physically there, technically, tactically and, and physically, by the way. Um, but I, I'm looking more of a physical perspective. So yeah, managers will often, you know, why has he stopped running? Why is, why is he look knackered, etc.? Yeah, I get all of that. Um, <laughs> but it is, yeah, it is, it's good to, to get that, I think. Dan, you mentioned just then about running the subs at the end of a game. Now, on um, recently we played Millwall and we noticed that the whole Millwall team and all of the subs came out and ran on the pitch. And I know I said to Chris, this is something I've not really seen very much. Is there any idea why they would have done that? Um, yeah, so there's, there's previous research or, or you know a, a previous thing was to get the subs out for a warm down if you like uh, sorry get the starting players out for a warm down so I, I think I come out at the end of that when that when their starting team were out they were just having a little jog and a stretch which which is perfect you know it's a good idea um, we we do it slightly differently ours is a little bit more passive inside we have ice baths set up and uh, our medical team are there for, for post-game massages and stuff and then we look at our mobility and our, our, our range of motion stuff on the day after and the day after that um, I'm not saying it's wrong or right. It's just just how we do it. So yeah, that, that's nothing new. Um, and then I think I think they did have all, all nine subs out, didn't they? So I, I will individualise ours depending on where they're at in the week, what they played in the game, how many games they've played, what 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 they need really from a from a physical perspective. Um, so sometimes I'll have all nine subs out. Sometimes some subs might come on at 45 minutes or, or or 55 minutes, and you know they perhaps don't need any work after the game in, in my opinion or, or at that time um, so so yeah that that's really yeah the nooks of it that's that's probably the reason why you mentioned just there down the medical department I guess the biggest the biggest question maybe unknown for those of us who aren't quite as insightful in terms of the the crossover between you and the medical department you've mentioned already at the start that you you meet with Dr Craig Roberts and the manager on a daily basis in the morning before training talk us through that crossover between you and the medical department how you work together sometimes is it difficult do you, do you have opposing opinions because of course sports medicine I guess would be described as the application of the science isn't it really yeah, for sure. Our, our team's grown massively. You know, when I first come here, it was it was Dave Gardner and, and Steve Hard. Um, both are still here, by the way, and I enjoy a you know a really good la- relationship with both of those guys. Um, the 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 you know the age old debate of the medical team are the ones kind of pulling back, if if you like, whereas the sports science conditioning team are the ones pushing players harder. So there's always that conflict b- between us, for sure, in, in that respect. But ultimately, I, I think you have to work together in order to, to achieve what you want and to get the players where you need them to be. So it might be that, you know, that they have, they know the injury history or, or more in depth injury history of certain players um, so that they know how they respond to load, etc. So they might recommend, you know, uh, doing less in this session or missing this session, which is, you know, is, is always up for discussion. And, and I think we work quite well in that respect. Um, the other side of it obviously is, is the rehab of injured players. So they will initially work with the with the physios and the medical team at the start, um, and they 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 will provide their their rehabilitation, and then as it gets towards the end, the end of their injury, they will then come with myself or Phil, Rob or Sean on the on the pitch, and and really we'll work together to get them conditioned to work where they need to be for the game and and to to get back to train and ultimately be fit enough to to contribute for the team on a, on a match day. So. Yeah, we we work very closely together. Um, the depart both, like I said earlier, both departments have grown a lot, um, and, and which can only be a good thing. You know, there's there's more more knowledge in the room, more experience, which which can only help us. I think. Dan, I don't think I've ever known a schedule like this season for obvious reasons, particularly the games schedule. You hear about Premier League managers complaining that they have to play two games in a week and stuff like that. And I know I asked 
the manager about that and he said we'd love to be playing two games in a week sometimes playing three games in eight days and what was it nine games in 21 days or something like that just before Christmas how um, how does that impact on player recovery and, and readiness and, and stuff like that for you? Yeah as you say I, I've never experienced it we had we had it the championship schedule is, is quite relentless as it is, you know, in a, in a normal season, let alone with the with the added factor of COVID um, and, and a shorter season, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it has been it has been challenging. But once you get into a rhythm, players get into a rhythm of kind of playing, recovering. Um, and, and what we're doing alongside that is, is kind of monitoring the players. So, you know, a, a good thing myself and myself, the sports science team and the medical team will come together. Um, typically on a Monday or a Thursday if we've played Saturday or Tuesday, so a, so a plus two day. Um, when the players report to training, they will all come through a, a series of, of tests that we'd run, um, just looking at their recovery markers, you know, you, you hit it on the head, we call it readiness testing. Um, so, so looking at different tests that assess their current status, how they've recovered from the game, where they're at in terms of, you know, it might be it might be neuromuscularly, so we look at their, their hamstring, um, their hamstring strength, we might look at their their ankle mobility. Um, we take some some blood markers from them and look at the muscle damage that's been created from the from the load of the game, and and as as we build those databases and those individual kind of thresholds for players, we know or, or we have a rough idea of where they should be at or where they're normally at compared, you know, in, in other games. And then you can look for the for the for the outliers if you like. Are they recovered properly? Okay, well he hasn't recovered quite as well here as we thought he might have done. He might get some extra work with the physios or, or he might not go on the pitch today to, to do X, Y, Z. Um, and, and that's become a really important system for us, I think, this season with so many games. Um, we're building up a, a, you know, a real good library of, of where players are at and, and using that to feed back to the manager and, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully keep the team as, as fit as we possibly can for our, for our ultimate game of getting promoted this year. Dan, it's obvious if a player gets an injury and they can't play, but... What about if a player is so exhausted in a previous game and you know he's run like covered every blade of grass and stuff like that? Is it your job to advise the manager to say, look, so and so has run put so much effort into one game that it might be an idea that he doesn't start the next game? Does that happen? Um, there's certain recommendations made that that might be you know feasible on on different days after different games. So so yeah, like I said, we have the GPS system. We know what players typically doing games we know what's normal for them what's high what's low um, and then ultimately how many games in a row they might have played recovery xyz so yeah that that information is definitely discussed with the medical team and and, and fed back to the manager and, and then like i said earlier it's down to to the coaching staff to the manager to perch to then take that information and, and use it as they will i'm not saying that the information is bang on and you know if you think that Certain players performed above where he normally does. Is he a high risk to injury? Potentially. But I, under no circumstance would you be able to say, yes, definitely, we should do that. I, I think it's all a kind of guiding process and, and using the data to inform rather than dictate. Dan, I guess in terms of players, just popping back to what you said before about readiness and recovery, are there players in the current squad, given the schedule they face this season and, and some of the dodgy pitches that they've played on as well elsewhere, that you've actually thought, do you know what, this is a, an amazing effort from this player to still be churning out these kind of results. Are there some guys in the squad who, I guess, defy your expectations as a scientist? For sure, for sure. You, you know, we're, we're seeing them playing games or, or games in a row that we've never seen them do before. So... You know, it comes down to that creating that robustness. You know, they're they're match fit and and they're they're becoming nice and robust in terms of the physical element and and how they get through games. And as long as we we do what we can to help them um, recover post game and and in the game in the time in between games, you know, they're, they're big players. And and ultimately, we need to have our best players on the pitch if we're going to do anything this season. So we want to do everything we can to help the manager and and help these players stay fit and and keep playing and impacting our results. And do you as a department and as a head take that as a barometer of, of how well you're doing if these players are churning out game after game, week after week? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, there's been too many instances where you could take it the other way and things have happened where you, you think, you know, was that my fault or could I have done something to help that? So I, I don't think there's there's anything to be gained from from looking at things like that and, and patting yourself on the back. I, I don't think that's the kind of business we're in. We're, we're a team. Um, and we're we're a kind of real small part of that team um, to help the to help the team do what we want to do this season. So so no, I, I don't think so. 
Staying with the team, um, every team, of course, plays differently. Every team, you know, some teams sit off, some people have a high press, some people are, you know, very, very energetic all over the pitch. How much does a certain style of play of a team fit with the work that you have to put in guys? And sometimes a guy is simply not suited physiologically, I guess, to the kind of the kind of style of play that one team might have. Yeah, that, that that's a good point, Chris. Um, when I met with with the manager, he outlined that he wanted to be a, a high pressing team. He wanted to get after teams. So, so yeah, you know, the, the, we need to get them used to, to be able to tolerate the level of work or, or the, we call it the, the worst case scenario that they would experience in a game. So looking at different time periods throughout that game and, and seeing, you know, what markers they need to be able to hit to be able to do that on the pitch and repeat, repeat that on the pitch um, to the benefit of the team. You mentioned nutrition a little bit earlier on as well, and you mentioned that you lean on Royce Wiggins quite a bit for, for advice on that. But just from a, I guess, a more general point of view, I mean, we go back to the days of, of boxes of pizzas being delivered to the team bus, and I'm sure that was budgetary more than a, more than a lot of other things. But these days, we see the players walking out of the game with a little brown box of sushi or chicken <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, just give us an overview on on nutrition, and I guess how you structure your advice and your guidance to the players, and I guess how good they are at taking it as well. Let me tell you, no matter what you give the players after a game, they will still moan. <laughs> the, since I've been here, we, when I first come in, you're right, we were using, I think, um, Domino's delivered to, to a bus, especially on away games. Um, we then used, I, I, I changed that to like, a, we, we'd find a local, a local kebab shop to, to where we were playing and go and get some, some chicken kebabs, um, chicken kebabs and chicken pitters, and, and we'd give them, they'd give them post game. We then had a state of going through Nando's. So we, we'd get Nando's delivered to the bus, which was a you know, pain in the backside for, for people like Jimmy Glass who had to go and collect it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now we, we have a chef, S.A., um, who, who's very good. So he'll cook up. We have buses, luckily, that, that we're able to cook on with ovens and stuff. So, you know, in, in that time preceding the game, it's important that they have, you know, a carbohydrate hit and, and a protein hit. We're, we're starting to recover them straight away um, from A, the muscle damage and, all, and the energy expenditure that, that they've had. Um, so it's trying to find ways that can get that, that nutrition back into them, the, the sugars, et cetera, everything that they need, but also making sure that they, they do take it. There's no point in putting on a perfect meal if players at the end of the day are going to go, no, nah, I don't want it. So the important thing is to, to, to help them to eat. So we put things like um, milkshakes on the bus, um, after a game and, and I've been back and forth with it but sometimes I, um, they have coke as well just to help replenish those, those carbohydrate stores and glycogen stores, stores that they've you know, depleted during the game. So it's trying to find little ways that, that, that we ad- keep the adherence but also benefit them physically as well. And as Domino's want to sponsor this podcast, other pizza places are available, of course, <laughs> as are other soft drinks and chicken manufacturers. Uh, <laughs> my BBC heads come on to me there for a second. Um, you mentioned there about the, the bus and away games. Um, what about uh, an average day in the training ground? Because I know the players come in and have breakfast and then obviously, I know at the moment, COVID protocols mean they can't all eat lunch in the, in the canteen and things as they normally would. But how much of, of what they eat breakfast and lunch-wise is dictated by you and is dictated by, I guess, maybe the training that you've done that day or, or which which match day minus one or two it is of the week yeah so so it's working closely with the chef and and now it's we're at a point where our two chefs essay and, and paul kind of know know what what dishes the guys need on a, on a recovery day on a on a match day plus one or or on a match day minus one they might need to load up minus two you know the carbohydrate content would would increase so the players can sort of fuel themselves for the for the game needed um but yeah and initially Initially, you, you sit down with the chefs and our old nutritionist, Matt Lovell, we would sit down and, and go through, you know, green days, red days, a high intensity day, a recovery day and, and what foods might benefit players on those days. Um, but then the chefs kind of get to know it. So then you give them the guidance and, and they then play with the dishes and they know feedback from what the players like, what certain players like. So it's, it's good to have that. You're giving them autonomy in terms of what to what kind of food groups they need, but then the freedom to say, you know what, why don't you you can try this or, or players might like this. Yeah, so, so it's, it's good. I guess uh, there's probably a greater adherence to everything, isn't there, when things are going well on the pitch? I think of, you know, maybe accepting a certain training programme or accepting a certain post-match meal or accepting something else. Do you find in your role that, I guess, probably coaches find the same, don't they? That the adherence and the, uh, the willingness to do everything. I'm not suggesting for a second people are unprofessional, but just in terms of the, the banter or the attitude you might get. Yeah, definitely. That is when it, when a team's more successful or winning games, um, 
they're, they're open to, to more things. Definitely. Well, I think that's, that's in all walks of life, really, isn't it? You're more open if you're, if you're happy. So, yeah, I, I would say that is the case. But that being said, our, our boys are very, very, very professional. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough of the group and, and, and how they kind of apply themselves and in and outside the training ground. You know, and that's testament to how they're performing and, and you know, regularly playing. Dan, I just want to ask you about sleep because um, I think it was a couple of years ago there was a story came out that one Premier League team took their own mattresses to away games and put them in the hotel that they were staying at overnight and everybody was sort of aghast at that but I would imagine they probably weren't the only one. Now, do we do things like that and, and what what's your view on, on sleep? Sleep is huge, Neil. I, I can't tell you, you know, how, how important sleep is from preventing disease to making sure you're refreshed to, um, for your body to adapt from exercise, etc. Sleep is, is really, really big, really important. Um, and that's something the manager here will, 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 will uh, it definitely understands as well. So we might adjust training schedules to allow the players to have a little bit more time in bed, uh, a little bit more time at home, especially post, post game, midweek, you know, when they're, when they're not back until late or they're not leaving until late they they a lot of the guys you'll find they have a lot of caffeine and a lot of um, adrenaline after the game and they won't sleep until sort of three four in the morning so you really need to think about that and, and cater for that in the days after after the after the event um in terms of mattresses and and stuff yes we uh we didn't go as far as mattresses but last season we had pillows um for players so we linked up with a pillow company um a pillow company, uh, a mattress company. I don't know what, what do you call them. Bed shop. <laughs> um, they, they're called Beds Are Us. You know, for for going on Chris's way of sponsoring the podcast. Um, and and they come in and provide an array of pillows for the guys to, you know, to to test briefly at the training ground, and then players and and staff. Yeah, staff jumped on it like Fletch. Definitely, I think he got two. Uh, they they jumped on it. Um, <laughs> And then we would, the sports science department, the kit men, even security would, would take, we, we have a head of security, Chris, and, and our chef that goes to the hotel before games. Um, so they would take the pillows up with them and, and get them delivered to each room. It's difficult for us to provide that service now with the amount of games we have. So players, if they want it, will take it themselves. Um, if not, they'll just, you know, live in the luxurious hotel pillows that we have. Just two quickies about the nutrition or the food side of things Dan you mentioned then that um there's a chef that can cook on the coach I mean when I when I first heard that I was I was I thought that was quite remarkable it's almost like you know how does that work how, you know is he got you know what, what's he got there an oven a fridge and and all this sort of stuff how does that work and, and then secondly are the players allowed to have treats maybe things that you wouldn't expect a professional athlete to have is that allowed yeah, so firstly, it's, it's become a lot more difficult since COVID for the chef because he's got to cook on two buses, bless him. <laughs> um, but at the back of the... How does he the, do that? Do you have to stop at the services yeah. and swap over? <laughs> no, so he, he will, uh, he'll stay on the buses as the game's going on and, and that's when, when he'll kick in and, and do his bit and, and cook the food. So at the, at the back of the bus, there's microwaves, there's ovens, um, there's you know mul multiple fridges everywhere to, to store the food. Um, we have plates and cutlery and stuff but all that stuff's ready for the players when they get on or or some players might not might not want to eat straight away so they might give it sort of 10 15 minutes and then they'll eat once once they're ready um so so that side of things is, is really important like i said earlier in, in terms of getting what you need what they need to have at that point in into them um and yeah neil i, I said i said about cokes and and milkshakes um, those type of things help get those sugars back in back into the players and, and replenish their, their stores. So, yes, um, we do do naughty things. I think there has been known to be the odd brownie flying around after the game as well. Um, <laughs> but as long as the guy the guys the guys know that that's important post game and, and probably not to have during the week, every day. Dan, we've taken up plenty of your time already. We've got quite a few, or a few shorter, I guess, uh, sport, uh, supporter questions to uh, to get through as well before the end. Um, let's uh, take a couple of those now, shall we? Uh, one of which comes from Mr. Fern on Twitter, who's a PE teacher based out in Poland, who says, how do you weight the training for players based on the different requirements of their positions on the field and what kind of factors would be in play? Yeah, so, so that would be where we use the, the GPS system. If, if we know what our fullbacks are doing or expected to do in a game, um, we would then, you know, we need to prepare them for that. So be that on the training pitch or, or, or in pre-season when we're running, etc. We know that the kind of 
intensities they need to get to. Um, and so we will condition them accordingly. So you might see a, a centre back might not be running as far as a full back or, or a, a centre mid might be running at less speed, so to speak, as, as a, as a centre forward um, who, who repeatedly sprint. So, yeah, we use all of that. And, and like I said, we, we use it as we call it worst case scenario. So it's really conditioning those players to be able to cope with the, the worst periods that they would face in a game physically, be it that individually or, or and positionally. I've got a, a supporter question from James McCafferty. Has Dan's general and football knowledge improved since he was nominated worst staff quiz team member 2014? <laughs> <laughs> that was Eddie Howe that voted me that. That was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, yes, I'm, I'm an intelligent guy, you know. We, <laughs> we, don't, we don't do many quizzes anymore, Neil, to be honest with you, but I'm sure that I would be right up there if we did. <laughs> The days of Steve Fletcher standing at the front of the bus with a mic are gone, are they, thankfully? Oh, yeah, we don't give him that much airtime because he would never stop talking. That's why he's banned from this podcast at the moment. We've <laughs> already got an hour or so. Um, a, co- a couple of other shorter <laughs> ones. Um, we'd expect the goalkeeper and the centre-backs maybe to be the, the beasts in the gym, but is there a, a secret weapon or two in the gym? Somebody who you would look at and think maybe isn't quite shifting the bigger numbers they are in the gym? Um, isn't quite shifting. Uh, we, we haven't, gym work this, this season has been difficult to, to obviously do with the amount of games we've had. So it's been really kind of maintenance sessions. Um, so no, no, nothing stands out really from this year. Um, last year, Nathan Ake was, was very good. Very good. You know, he, he worked closely with, with, my, with our strength coach, Ben Donachie and, and, you know, was, it was in a really good place. Um, but then obviously COVID hit, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. Ian, Hensman from Australia has asked a question. He's asked about sleep, which you've already answered. He has also asking your top three meals for nutrition. What what would they be? It's difficult. It, it depends on, on the timing, really. It depends. Are you looking at recovery? Are you looking at, you know, loading for the game? It, it's, it's yeah, depending on what, what, what the outcome is or what we're preparing for. What about you if you were to choose your your top three that you wanted to eat? Me personally, um, <laughs> uh, 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 my kids' favourite meal is salmon, rice and broccoli, believe it or not. Um, Spot the children of a sports scientist honestly, or somebody involved in nutrition. Honestly, you wouldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the top dishes in my house and, and, and yeah, they, they're also big fans of sushi. Honestly, would you believe it? I can't believe I'm saying that live on the podcast. <laughs> um, Rob on Twitter, AFCB Rob says, and this is one thing we, we haven't touched too much on, obviously injuries, uh, you know, a, a crossover, I guess, between yourself and the, the medical department. We're, we're seeing a lot of hamstring injuries in footballers this season with the schedule and after restart with the, the schedule and, and Bournemouth weren't obviously strangers to that either. What are the key things that you use to assess a player's likelihood of a muscle injury? Can you assess a player's likelihood of a muscle injury? I think you can do certain things which might, you know, help condition players or inform you of, of the status of where they're at currently. We try and expose our players um, to, to regular Nordics, which which is a, an eccentric hamstring exercise, um, which is, you know, research has shown to, to help prevent um, hamstring injuries. We're also big on, on max speed and, and ensuring that players kind of hit their threshold, their individual threshold for max speed. Um, sort of every 10 days or so if they don't get it in a game. So that that's also an, an important dose or been shown to be an important dose for preventing those kind of injuries um, and like I said that the readiness testing that we do where we, where we look at the hamstring we look at groins and looking at their thresholds how strong are they at that point how well recovered are they from that game all, all these kind of things kind of help us to, to inform sorry help to inform us of where players are at and, and the kind of risks that might come with that. Dan right at the start of this podcast you spoke about how you knew quite quickly that you weren't going to become a professional footballer, I, I think you said. Now, just obviously when there's an in-house game, I know that people like you to be on their side and I certainly heard people in my department say if he's on the opposite side, we need to kick him early on. Just tell us about how <laughs> how frustrating it was and just tell us a little bit about your career as a footballer. Yeah, I, I didn't really have a career as a footballer, to be honest with you. No, um, <laughs> I, I like every boy in the world um played played younger and, and really into my football my um my uncle was actually a, a professional footballer glenn glenn hodges so football was a really big thing in in our house and and in our family um so me and my brother played a lot 
um, I, I, I realised probably at university that I wasn't as good as I thought I probably was. <laughs> I played for the university team but, but, and, and tried to play a couple of semi-pro games um, whilst at university, but I, I didn't really do anything. I think I had one or two appearances, which was slightly embarrassing. Um, the, the players here will, will absolutely batter me, but I did have a little stint at Crystal Palace when I was, I think, under 12 to under 14s. Um, Again, I think that was a story, Neil, that I might have done with you <laughs> when you were interviewing me for the Echo. I got absolutely annihilated for that and I still haven't lived that down. Um, but but now it's it's just recreational. Um, you know, when, when there's staff games, I, I love I love playing. Um, I can be seen to be very, very weak mentally and, and people can get in my head quite easily and that can influence how well I play. But uh, yeah. You, you, you just briefly touched on your uncle Glyn there, I mean, he had some playing career and those of a certain age will remember the crazy gang of Wimbledon very well and I know that he was a, he was a part of that and a, and a Wales international. So how important was he in your career coming into football, if you like? And you, just tell us what, how much do you know about his playing days because they probably would have been when you were very young, if, if even born. No, I, I remember him. I, I remember him playing. Obviously, not probably not at the, the peak of his career, like you said, at, at Wimbledon and, and, and Watford and, and Wales. Uh, but I, I remember going with my dad as a kid to, to watch him play. Um, one big memory is, is, is watching him warm up. And then I was cold, I think, sitting in the stands. And he came running over to me and, and gave me his drill top when he was playing for Sheffield United. And obviously, it was the awe of everyone around me having, <laughs> you know, taken his drill top off, off one of the players on the pitch. But um, he, he's. Yeah, he's a big influence in, in terms of what I, what you know how I how I got into football and and, and is is always readily available for advice on football. I speak with him very regularly. Um, he, he him and and his wife and my cousins up there housed me when I when I went to Manchester City and and put me up. You know, and I lived with them for a period of time. I, I can't speak highly enough of of how he's helped me and and the advice that he's given me. It's you know it's it's brilliant and and a brilliant knowledge to to. A brilliant person to know and, and ultimately love as my uncle. So, yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough of, of Uncle Glyn. <laughs> <laughs> uncle Glyn, I think, is uh, a very good place to finish. We've had you for nearly an hour, Dan. I know you've got lots of things going on uh, behind the scenes. So we will we'll leave it there for now. Um, hopefully it's been really insightful for you guys listening at home. Dan, it's been great to, uh, to listen to, so I guess, the processes and uh, not just about for your career, but how things get to a match day and how those 11 in red and black turn out on a, on a Saturday afternoon. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. No problem, Chris. Neil, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Well, Neil, I don't know about you, but over the last hour, I have learnt plenty about what goes on behind the scenes of the uh, the sports science department. Absolutely fa fascinating insight, Chris. Like, like I said in the podcast, we've gone from absolutely having nothing to do with sports science, just e even in the early 90s. Um, like you said, it was a it's one man and his job. I remember Joe Roach used to run the youth academy all on his own and Sean would run all the, the physiotherapy side all on his own. And now everywhere in football, you've got sports scientists and analysts and medical staff. It's just such a growing industry and such an important industry and a fascinating insight from Dan there in, in, into the workings of it. I guess as players have got faster and stronger and the game has, has moved on so much in terms of the technology available to, to all these guys as well, that it just means you have to you have to keep pace, don't you, with everybody. It can be the difference, small margins and all that. Well, I mean, you know, how have things gone? I mean, it used to be a cup of tea at half time and, you know, a little bit of deep heat before you went out and, and, and that was that was about it. You were, you, certainly that was what it was like on a Sunday morning. I don't know whether, <laughs> whether that was what it was like as a professional, but um, like I said, I mean... You know, the fact that you've got the, the chef cooking on the coach and, you know, we talked about the nutrition. I mean, I remember the days when they stopped at a fish and chip shop and got cotton chips on the way home, Christian. It wasn't that <laughs> wasn't that long ago. Cotton chips twice, times 11. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil, great to have you back alongside uh, on this episode of the podcast. If you are listening on your podcast platform, don't forget to subscribe and give us a rating. You can share us on social media as well. Just make sure you include the hashtag AFCBpod. For all of your club updates, remember to go to the club website, which is afcb.co.uk, which is also where you'll be able to find out when to listen to the next edition of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Don't forget also to purchase your match pass to watch the upcoming games live on AFC. FCB TV. But from myself, Chris Temple, Neil Perrett, and our guest Dan Hodges, thanks for listening. Until next time.